And uh, oh, thank you very much. Um, and so the purpose of this uh, BOF is to just uh, share our experiences that we've had on, on the Crusher uh, TDS system. So let me skip right through. Uh, this is kind of our, uh, our plan uh, for, for the session. So uh, we'll have like four uh, presentations uh, or so. This introductory presentation from me, and I'll say a few words about our experience with uh, Lattice QCD applications. Uh, then Tom Papa Theodore uh, will talk about uh, issues that have been learned or lessons that have been learned from you know the tickets that came through uh, and um, from the various hackathons that have happened. And then Johan Blaschke from uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs will uh, talk about the experience with XIFEL as an external application. And then um, we will have a short break. We can refill our coffees, uh, answer the calls of nature, etc. cetera. Um, and then after the break, uh, Matt is going to tell us about E3SM uh, uh, MMF application, which is a, a weather application. And then we can have a panel discussion and uh, Tim Mattox uh, from HPE and Corbin Robeck have kindly agreed to join us as, as panel members uh, to present a vendor perspective. Uh, I will probably be emceeing the discussion. And I guess the, the, the plan is basically to uh, maybe gather some questions and topics. If you put them in the chat, we can collect them. Uh, and then uh, basically we will just ask a few, as many of them as time will allow and pass them around the panel for their opinion. I've got a couple of housekeeping notes here for everybody. Uh, this session is not covered by NDA uh, and we are recording the meeting for posterity and also so that people who have conflicts with the session can come back and watch it. Um, and so we should really refrain from discussing any NDA topics. Uh, and if a question sort of verges on the NDA area, uh, we will probably demur uh, in our answers. Um, and also, I would very much like to express my thanks to Nicholas Uncook Paisan uh, from Oak Ridge for helping with the session and with uh, Zoom and recordings and all those things. So with that, uh, let me get into the presentation. So just a basic introduction to Crusher. Uh, Crusher, as, as you all know, is the TDS system for Frontier. I'll have some system details in the next slide. And in terms of the history, I think I think the ORNL liaisons to ECP teams were enabled somewhere around the end of November last year, and that ECP teams in general uh, were allowed on on January the 10th. Um, after that, uh, we had some training events. So we had the the Crusher training event uh, on the 13th of January, and that was followed uh, by two hackathons. Uh, the first hackathon uh, was uh, mostly for a car. Uh, but there were some ECP AD teams there. And then the second hackathon uh, was a week after, and that was mostly for ECP AD teams. Um, and future hackathons are going to be in the pipeline. Tom will be able to tell you about them possibly. Um, and of course, the other thing that's important and one of the reasons we're having this session is that Crusher Access was enabled with the system in a fairly early stage with some definite known sort of stability issues. And so I think uh, an anonymous comment I would bring to you is uh, that we would usually never let folks on a system this early. Uh, and that also means that uh, everyone who, who was on Crusher uh, went through uh, all the journey uh, with us uh, as we cope with these uh, various instabilities. And uh, I think user tickets and hackathon feedback helped us a lot. And so Tom will be able to talk about that next. And, Finally, as a, as a quick sort of piece of trivia, I believe that the machine is named after Dr. Beverly Crusher, uh, just because the naming scheme appears to be ship's doctor and significant alien. So we had Spock and uh, so we have, uh, yeah, we had Spock and Bones. And so now we have Crusher and Borg. Uh, and so that just seems to be the pairing. Anyway, uh, so then a little bit of info about Crusher, just a refresher. Crusher is an HP Cray EX uh, supercomputer architecture. I've got this picture of the racks here from uh, one of our, our uh, and, uh, presentations uh, from uh, Joe Glensky in the Crusher training. And uh, Crusher has two racks in it. 
uh, each uh, and each node has uh, 164 core HPC optimized third gen Epic CPU, I think is the official name, uh, and four AMD MI250 instinct GPUs. And uh, in terms of programming, each of these GPUs uh, is made up of two GCDs, uh, which look like kind of individual uh, GPUs. Uh, but in terms of hardware, it's, it's, it's four GPUs. And the nodes are connected by the HP Slingshot interconnect. And uh, we have both uh, AMD and uh, HP CC tools uh, as part of the Cray software stack. And the blades itself have two nodes per blade. I've, I've got the image from, from Joe Glensky's talk here. And uh, I kind of drew manually on the boxes to make just a little bit easier to identify which bit is which. And the node architecture, this uh, picture is from the Crusher Quick Start Guide. And the most important things that I'd like to draw your attention to is that there are many speeds and feeds here. Uh, but in particular, the NICs are connected directly to the GPUs uh, and uh, specifically to actual GCDs. And the other aspect is that the, the mapping uh, from, from NUMA region and cores uh, to GPUs is, um, is not necessarily the simplest one. So you kind of need to have this diagram as a decoder ring if you want to specifically bind uh, specific sets of cores uh, to the right GPUs, to the right NUMA domain, and that way also to the right mix. Okay, so you can find this picture on the quick start guide for, for later. And then there's good sources of where to get help. I would say uh, the quick start guide is there and it has a list of known issues. Um, if you fall afoul of an issue, it's always good to check first whether it may be one of the known issues. The Frontier Center of Excellence Confluence site has migrated now to the ECP Confluence site. And I think uh, this link is clickable. So if you get this slide later on, you'll be able to click these links to get to the various pages. Um, and uh, ECP Confluence has a discussion forum, which certainly used to generate fairly quick answers from the vendors. Um, and uh, the other aspect is that you, you need to have access to the ECP Confluence, obviously, to access this, which has its usual two-factor authentication. You should please send tickets to help the olcf.ornl.gov, and it helps to categorize them if you mention Crusher in the subject. Um, the best way for your tickets to get traction is if you have some form of reproducer that you can either point us to or attach. Uh, and then other ways to get help, if, you have, if you're one of the apps that has a liaison here, you should contact your liaison. Um, if you want higher level issues or if you do not have a liaison, you should feel free to contact me. I, I think my email was at the start of the of the uh, presentation, but you can always get hold of me anyway, and I can I can route you to the right place. Okay, um, so then now we're at about uh, ten past. So uh, in the next five six minutes, I just want to say a few words about the experience we had with Lattice QCD, um, and I have slide information about two codes primarily. Uh, one is uh, uh, the Chroma software stack that I work with. This relies on uh, uh, a layer called QDP JIT, which does some dynamic compilation using the LLVM AMD GCN backend directly. And then we use the CUDA library, uh, which is a library for QCD on accelerators developed uh, originally uh, by uh, our colleagues who now work at NVIDIA, and it's, it's maintained at NVIDIA. But over the last year and a bit, we've been having very regular meetings uh, with vendor partners, not just from NVIDIA, but also AMD and uh, Intel. And uh, CUDA has gone through a lot of refactorings. And it's now in a state where it's actually in good shape uh, on, uh, on AMD systems and also getting into really good shape for the Intel systems too. From the point of view of this discussion, it runs on Crusher. Uh, and I've also run it on an internal system called Borg, which is essentially uh, more for our systems folks, but is the same kind of hardware. And uh, my current bumps in the road, uh, I haven't yet tried it with the latest Rockham 5.0X and 5.1X. Um, I had one quick uh, cursory go and there were some CMake issues that are known issues, uh, I believe, uh, about uh, you know the, the compiler Clang being renamed. Uh, and so 
uh, CMake had to have its architecture definition file updated to look for the new name. Um, and, uh, but this, you know, can all be worked around. Um, and then there are some, uh, the current showstopper, I guess, for me is I see node failures uh, on Crusher. I see them very frequently, mostly when I'm running the code with direct communication enabled between GPU to GPU. And, um, and I've not been able to root cause this uh, at the moment. It just happens uh, sometimes sporadically. And I think my success rate has been something like two out of 15 runs will, will finish and the others will, will fail with this. Um, one thing I try to do is I tried dumping the message, you know, for each node. I would start it up in a kind of daemon mode, redirect its output to a, a file for the node uh, so that after the crash, I could look on that file and, and see what happens. But so far, I haven't seen anything that would, uh, that would surprise me that shows up there. Um, so this is something that we are still looking at and tracking. So for my future work uh, with, with CUDA and Chroma, um, is to basically go through uh, the fight with uh, any of the sort of workarounds I need for Rockham 5X and maybe try a newer MPI stack that's on Crusher because uh, there are some new installations there and then, um, then go from there. I think these MPI failures, we submitted a bug about them previously, but there were other bugs with similar symptoms. So you know we weren't sure if it's the same. So I may need to submit this bug again. Yeah, if the issues persist with the new versions of everything. So, and just to show you kind of a rough performance, I have here, this is what we call our money plot. It's sort of our evolution of our gate generation form uh, through the ages on various architectures. Uh, on the left, we have Titan, that was our baseline. Uh, and then as we went through on Summit, we, we first just did a straight port. And then we put in a whole bunch of algorithmic improvements. So that's what brought us down to this 329th uh, second run. And then when we looked at Borg, uh, sorry, when we looked at uh, Spock, uh, we, we had actually slower performance at the time. Uh, but we could uh, run on just uh, a 64 MI 100 because of the larger memory of those, of those chips. And then uh, for, for the MI250X, I have a run that completed on Borg, but I should say that that's from circa November. Um, it, it's a number we, we uh, presented in a shape or form at, at the SC in an AMD booth talk. And I really want to point out that that was so early on that it really is subject to change. So take it with a pinch of salt. It's more of an existence proof than a final benchmark. And then you can see some of the newer NVIDIA architectures there. Um, I ran on Perlmutter and colleagues uh, from NVIDIA have run on Selene, which is an internal system. And I think the only comment I would make is on, on Perlmutter also, I couldn't really get uh, the GPU to GPU direct communications working. So I think I ended up doing um, the runs without. Okay, shifting gear. Uh, I want to talk about another uh, application uh, that I, I sent out rather late some calls for uh, if people wanted to present something. Uh, so Peter Boyle very kindly sent me some information about the grid code. And I've got the statistics over here. And um, you can get the code from GitHub. But one of the uh, interesting things from an algorithmic point of view is that grid uh, does something called uh, a domain decomposed version of the algorithm. Uh, which doesn't just mean that you know we 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 lay out the the, the lattice over multiple GPUs in a blocked up way, but you almost kind of do it's like individual separate simulations without communicating, um, and then you only need to communicate on on certain steps, and uh, so this is very GPU friendly. Um, there's a paper about it that you can read. I put the reference there from the archive. I, I'm sorry I forgot to to link it. But the nice thing about this approach is that it can mix and match on and off those communications. All it really does is it changes the size of your domain, right? So uh, when Peter first sent me the data, he had full communications or no slingshot communications and no infinity fabric. And I was like, well, okay, if you have no slingshot, then, then what's happening? And he, that's when he told me basically it's just a different size domain. So the current issues uh, we have, um, 
or that Peter reported. He said Rockham 5.1. Uh, brings up, picks up somehow and links in the wrong version of the AMD HIP64, the SO, that's the, a, the HIP runtime basically. And I believe this is also something that is a known issue and there are workarounds. And in fact, Peter has been using those workarounds. And the other comment that you could see in the data on the next slide is the 64 cube by 128 size global volume occasionally just crash. So there's just no data for that in places. And um, and that kind of intrigued me because a lot of the troubles I've been having are also with the 64 cube by 128 lattice. But of course, our algorithms are very different. So that may just be coincidence. Uh, the general comment I got from Peter at the end of the email was progress is good. Even a month ago, I had much more problems. So let me skip on to the next slide. Uh, here's some data Peter sent me. Um, so he said on us, uh, what he found is he, he got a substantial improvement uh, going from Rockham 4.5 to Rockham 5.1. So on a single GCD, he got, uh, I think, uh, something like a 30% uh, speed up, a 1.3x speed up. And then the two plots you have at the bottom here, I don't know if my cursor is showing up, but uh, these are basically the sides, uh, the, the, the lattice sites, and they're all split over eight nodes. Um, and within the node, one can imagine there's a two by two by two by one uh, grid. And so then you have the, the full comes, no string shot uh, or no infinity fabric. Uh, no infinity fabric means that the GPs just don't communicate at all. And so you can see that when you have no infinity fabric, you, you tend to see uh, an improvement, of course, because there's, there's no communication uh, and performance tends to increase the bigger your uh, your global volume is, which again is reasonable. Uh, I would expect this to top out at some volume. Over here on the 64 cubed by 128 uh, point, you see that uh, full comes worked, but the other runs somehow failed. Um, we don't, that's the, the spurious fails he mentioned. And the other comment I wanted to make is that if you take the data for 64 cubed by 256, and project it onto this uh, rightmost graph, which is 128 cubed by 256. That's a factor of eight growth uh, in two each in the X, Y, and Z directions. And it also is a factor of eight growth in terms of pressure nodes used from eight to 64. So you can think of this uh, going from 64 cubed to 128 there as a sort of a weak scaling. Um, and you can see that yeah, it's it's pretty flat. It's dropped down a little bit, but it's 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 not very bad at all. And all this was done with Rockham 4.5. And so Peter projects that uh, while here the maximum performance he got overall for the 64 nodes is 542.8 teraflops. His projection for Rockham 5.1 is around 670 teraflops. So these are are, are very good performances. So let me then, then sum up, and I'm pretty much on time. Uh, the code is up and running, you know, both Chrome and QDP JIT. Also, I believe the milk and CPS codes, uh, you, which both we all use CUDA, are, are, are doing well. Uh, grid is up and running. We got a few bugaboos left, uh, you know, like the rock of the packaging issues with the libraries we link and so on. Um, the crashes, which uh, I, I, I'm particularly frustrated by the crashes because I like debugging these things and I don't know what I can do to debug them. Um, and of course, uh, most recently I had one great comms issue reported by Philip Steer. So we'll work with him on submitting a ticket after the all hands meeting. And as things continue to stabilize, uh, I guess these issues are expected to resolve. Mm -hmm. And I will open it up to maybe one quick question because we're, we're pretty much on time. Questions? Let's look at. I can't see the chat. So, so Ballant, uh, there was there was one question uh, uh -huh. that I can repeat, and um, I might actually answer it um, unless you want to. Uh, but it was the question was about um, regarding it was regarding reproducers. So you know, you basically saying what they used to do and what is what really needs to be sent in with the reproducers. And I would say that. Um, if you send in a reproducer, uh, of course, the code, right? But um, what's needed is the 
environment that you compiled and ran it in, right? So maybe a list of modules. You can just do module list. If you do module dash T list, it'll give it to you in a terse form. It's easier to post. Um, and, uh, you know, the build instructions for it. Uh, if there's any environment variables that you, uh, that you set before running, right? Maybe there's some sort of a uh, setup bash script you could have that loads the modules for you if you source it and sets those uh, environment variables uh, in addition to the code. Just sort of explaining this is what I do. Basically, yeah, giving what you did from a fresh login so that I can then get on and do exactly what you did. It does become a bit more uh, complicated if you have, for instance, some software that you built in your own project directory that maybe I don't have access to, but letting us know about that so we can try to build it and reproduce it is, is helpful. But trying to make it as uh, you know, self-contained as possible is the, is the key. Thank you very much, uh, Tom, for, for, for taking that question. At this point, I would say, because we're, we're, we're a little, just already a little bit over time, I'm going to hand it over to Tom. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing, and we can also take up more of these questions in the discussion forum at the end. So thank you, everyone. Take it away, All right. Tom. All right, we'll go ahead and share my screen. I believe you should be seeing my screen and not my emails right now. Is that true? That is true. Okay. I'm going to grab a laser pointer. <clears throat> okay, so uh, my name is Tom Papa Theodore. Uh, I'm an HPC engineer in the System Acceptance and User Environment Group at uh, OLCF. I'm going to talk about uh, some lessons that we learned from the uh, Crusher hackathons and the support tickets that come in for Crusher. Um, <clears throat> We actually see uh, sort of a common story from our application teams. Um, and so I'm going to uh, go through these lessons learned sort of in the context of that, that story. Um, and so uh, in many cases, what we're seeing so far is that the initial port, say from Summit to uh, Spock or Crusher is fairly straightforward. Um, and when people get on Crusher and start running, they realize that there's some optimization that's needed to realize their expected performance. Um, so right, so they sort of follow through this bulleted list. Um, they port their code to Crusher. They find that their many teams, not all, uh, find that their initial performance is either similar or less performant than it is on Summit. And that kind of gives them pause. Uh, and they wonder, OK, well, what's going on here? What can I do? Um, and so. What they really what, what they need to do and what they are given advice to do is first to try to understand the performance that's actually expected for your application, right? Because it is application specific. And I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, then they can do things, uh, things as simple as testing your slurm bindings uh, to other things where you dive in a bit more in detail with profiling your applications. Uh, and hopefully that's something, I don't think that it is, but hopefully uh, most teams will be uh, doing this sort of by default, right, on Summit, on Spock, on Crusher, so forth, um, to, to see what's going on. And so what we find is that many of these application teams run into similar issues uh, that need to be addressed. Uh, so, of course, there's the usual suspects. So there's things like, um, you know, occupancy, register usage, kernel launch parameters. These are things that you needed to do on Summit. Uh, when you move to this new system, of course, there are differences in the hardware. Um, and so you need to uh, sort of reprofile and see what's going on in those aspects. Um, and then there are some other system specific considerations. So there's things like the slurm bindings that I mentioned. There's hardware atomics, there's managed memory, uh, these sorts of things where you know, a user might not realize that this is something that needs to be uh, accounted for. Uh, but once the application or software teams uh, address whatever subset of these issues are relevant for their application, uh, then they typically find that expected performance. Um, and so uh, it's these system specific considerations that I'm going to cover uh, to show sort of how these things can be addressed maybe before even diving into the optimization uh, that you'll need to do on your code uh, through profiling. Um, okay, so. First, to talk about the expected performance, um, we have uh, a, a table down here that shows a GPU to GPU comparison on Summit and Crusher. 
uh, it's really a GPU to GCD comparison, uh, since this is a column for a single GCD of the MI250X. Um, and so what you can see is that uh, over in this column, that the compute performance by the numbers is about 3.3 times faster on Crusher on one of the GCDs than it is on Summit. And so people see this and they think, okay, so when I run my application on uh, Crusher, I should see about a three times speed up. Uh, but that's of course not necessarily the case. Um, and so you need to look at your own application and decide, you know, am I GPU bound or am I data transfer bound? And if you're GPU bound, in this case, we're talking about uh, the kernels, right? So we're talking about um, uh, that your code is dominated by the kernels um, that are th that are running. And if you are GPU bound, are you compute bound or memory bound? If you're compute bound, then maybe you can look uh, at this this first row here to think, okay, roughly what I should get is about a three times speed up. Um, but if you're memory bound, uh, then you'd need to look at this third row to see. Uh, okay, so it's about 1.8 times as fast uh, on on the, the HBM bandwidth on Crusher than it is on Summit. And so if I'm uh, memory bound, then this is the uh, performance increase that I might be expected to see or something close to this. It's of course not as cut and dry as this, but I'm just uh, pointing this out as sort of a rough back of the envelope what you might expect to see. Because uh, people have asked this questions at the hackathons and other in tickets and that sort of thing. Um, if you're data transfer bound, then you would want to consider the CPU to GPU bandwidth and the comparison there in the table. And you can see on Summit with NVLink, we had a 50 gigabyte per second uh, NVLink between the CPU and GPU. Whereas on Crusher with Infinity Fabric, between the CPU and GPU anyways, uh, we have 36 gigabyte per second for the peak. Uh, and so that's only about 70% of the CPU to GPU bandwidth that was on uh, Summit. So you need to sort of look at um, what your code uh, uh, should expect, your code specifically should expect uh, with this, uh, with these performance expectations uh, to try to get a rough idea of what you should uh, expect to see. And so, of course, it's possible that you are sort of a combination of these things and you might have to just sort of uh, mentally wait uh, which ones of these are the most important, but it should give you maybe a closer idea to what uh, you should expect instead of just looking at the numbers and thinking uh, thinking of the compute performance. Uh, at the end of these slides, when you get them, there's also a node to node comparison with these similar um, uh, similar characteristics. Okay, so with the expected um, uh, numbers in mind, we'll move on to talk about the slurm bindings. So this is something that we've seen commonly from the teams leading to things from peg faults to poor performance. And so I wanted to point out uh, what some of these issues are. So to do so, we first have to look at a crusher node. Uh, and so what you can see here um, if, is that we have this sort of cartoon blown up view of a CPU and it shows the 64 uh, uh, physical CPU cores. These are the dark blue boxes here labeled zero down to 63. Uh, in parentheses, you see the hardware thread IDs associated with those cores. Um, and what I would point your attention to, well, first I would mention, we also have these eight GPUs over here. Uh, those are of course the individual GCDs where each MI250X has two GCDs as we see here. But for the applications, the system uh, shows these to you as individual GPUs. So I label them as such in this diagram. Um, so what I would point your attention to then are that you can see these cores zero through seven here, these eight cores all share this L3 cache. And this L3 cache region and the cores associated with it, they have a, an affinity for a specific GPU. And in this case, you can just follow this blue line uh, that's the infinity fabric here from CPU to GPU and follow it to the GPU that it has this affinity for. And so it's GPU four. Uh, the Eight cores, core eight through 15 in this L3 region have an affinity for GPU five and so forth. And so what you can see is that this is not an obvious mapping, right? It's not going sequentially from zero to seven. Um, and so this can be something that, um, this is something that should be mapped properly uh, and needs to be checked to make sure it is being, being mapped properly. Uh, right, so that was just me attempting to show, show that. Um, 
So, so let's see what happens here. <clears throat> um, this is a job step that runs on one node. It has eight uh, MPI ranks. Each MPI rank has one physical CPU core associated with it. And there is one GPU per task. And so if I run this hello world program, uh, what it'll do is it'll write out the MPI rank ID. It'll show which hardware thread it ran on. Uh, and it will show the GPU ID that it was mapped to, <clears throat> where this GPU ID here is the sort of node global ID, uh, similar to what you see here, uh, but not the runtime ID. So what you can see is that MPI rank zero uh, lands on hardware thread zero, which lives in this L3 region. And so it should have an affinity for GPU four, but that's not what's mapped to it. It's mapped to GPU one. Uh, MPI rank one is mapped to hardware thread eight, uh, which should be mapped to GPU five, but it's not, it's GPU one. And so this is non-ideal mapping. Um, this should still work. It just might give you degraded performance depending on what your code is doing. <clears throat> so instead, uh, a simple thing to do is just to add this dash dash GPU bind equals closest, uh, and that will do the mapping correctly for you. <clears throat> Uh, and so you can see that here we're mapping four, five, two, three, six, seven, zero, one, which is, of course, not ideal or not uh, intuitive, but it is the ideal situation. Uh, another thing that can happen that we see is people, because, right, people are uh, maybe going by the docs, or maybe they're just looking in the man pages, which is fine, uh, but they might find instead this GPUs per node and think, okay, well, I'm going to set that, and I set it equal to eight. And what this does is it it makes all eight GPUs available to your job step, right? Your S run command. And so this is the same thing we did before, except we're just running with this uh, GPUs per node equals eight. And you can see what happens without a particular binding flag. Uh, it's going to give all MPI ranks ac access to all GPUs, all eight GPUs. And so if you don't have logic in your code to do the mapping from MPI rank to uh, a GPU, then all of your ranks are just going to assume GPU zero and they'll all be running on the same GPU, which is of course not, uh, not correct. And will certainly give you degraded performance um, unless they're doing very little work uh, in that case. So, you know, this is another way that uh, people have run into issues. Uh, and this is something that, um, you know, testing your slurm bindings is really the way to uh, resolve this. <clears throat> there are some things that we're, we're working on to try to make uh, maybe some better defaults uh, to where it will give you the correct mapping by, by default, that sort of thing. Uh, but in general, on any system that you run on anymore with these fat nodes that have all these resources and you have multiple MPI ranks and open MP threads, uh, it, it's just, a, it, it should essentially be a requirement to, to uh, test your job steps first. And so there's this code that you can go grab and it's as simple as this, I won't go through it, but, um, it allows you to do what I was just showing you there, right? Which is showing your mapping from where your MPI ranks and open MP threads land. Uh, and that's a simple thing to do to test this before running uh, to make sure you're doing uh, what, what you expect. So another issue that we saw a lot at the hackathons was uh, regarding um, atomic operations. <clears throat> so there was a lot of teams that were finding poor performance or incorrect uh, results. And so I'll show you uh, what we what we learned there. So, uh, in general, hardware atomics on on Crusher are going to be faster than um, the software enabled atomics. Um, but importantly, uh, users need to explicitly request hardware atomics. Uh, otherwise, uh, they're going to be done uh, in software, so using cast loops, for instance. And so, um, you need to give this dash m unsafe fp atomics flag to enable these hardware atomics. And so that might strike people as sort of strange at first to see, okay, I've got this unsafe uh, flag. Um, and what this is uh, referring to is sometimes it's unsafe to use this and sometimes it's, it's safe. Uh, and whether or not it's safe or unsafe is determined by the granularity of the memory that's allocated. Uh, so the granularity in this case simply means uh, whether or not the, it refers to the coherency uh, between the memory being used inside of a kernel and the memory outside on the rest of the system. So there's two different uh, types of memory or granularities. There's coarse-grained memory and fine-grained. With coarse-grained memory, uh, coherence with the rest of the system uh, needs to be obtained at synchronization points. So hit device synchronize, for instance. Uh, 
whereas fine-grained memory allows the CPU and GPU to synchronize uh, while the kernel is running. Uh, but it's important to point out that only coarse-grained memory can be used in hardware atomics. If you request this flag with coarse-grained uh, memory, then, then it's safe. If you use this flag while uh, you know, targeting or using fine-grained uh, uh, atomics, or I'm sorry, fine-grained memory, uh, then what's going to happen is uh, it's going to silently produce a no-op, uh, which means that you're going to get incorrect results because it's not doing anything. Uh, and so that can give incorrect results in some cases, or it can give uh, poor performance by just not realizing you need to use this flag. Some people at the hackathons were able to just add this flag in and instantly uh, you know, get their expected performance, whereas before they just didn't understand what was going on. They may have sort of pinpointed it down to something weirds going on with the atomics, um, but didn't realize uh, that they needed that flag to try to, to, to enable it. So uh, this, this is a topic that sort of uh, needs its own presentation on. So I'm not going to try to go into the details of you know, what gives coarse grain versus what gives fine grain granularity. We're currently working with AMD to provide training. Uh, and documentation on this topic, uh, and this should be available relatively soon uh, to get into our users' hands. Uh, if there are questions you have on this, of course, you can uh, email me directly, or you could submit a help ticket. Uh, another place that we saw um, some uh, issues with poor performance was with managed memory. And this was from the hackathons as well as uh, in tickets. Um, and so what you need to understand about uh, managed memory if you're not familiar, uh, this is where you uh, are essentially uh, implicitly letting the uh, system decide when memory, when your uh, data needs to be moved instead of doing it explicitly. So uh, this can work by either zero copy memory access. And in this, this means that the CPU reads directly from GPU memory, for instance, or vice versa. Um, or it can be done uh, by migrating pages when a page fault is, uh, is encountered. And to understand which will be used, then users need to know about uh, XNAC. So XNAC allows the GPUs, these AMD GPUs, to migrate memory on page faults uh, between the CPU and the GPU. Um, and so this is for managed memory only. Um, by that, I mean memory uh, in this unified virtual address space, not necessarily just hip malloc managed, but that is one way to think about it if you're just sort of slightly familiar with managed memory, you might be familiar with, you know, hip malloc managed or CUDA malloc managed, uh, and that's sort of what I'm talking about here. Um, but right, so XNAC support has to be enabled at both compile time uh, and at runtime. So a code that's compiled with XNAC support and runs in an environment with XNAC enabled, uh, it will then migrate the pages between the CPU and the GPU on page fault. Um, a code that is not compiled with XNAC and does not run an environment with XNAC enabled, uh, it's going to uh, use this zero copy memory access. And so uh, might be slower depending on your application. Uh, in a lot of cases, the page faulting is, is the faster way to go. Um, so zero copy still gives you the correct answers. You'll just see sort of slow, uh, uh, slow kernels as the pages get transferred back and forth. Or I'm sorry, as the, ac the memory is accessed uh, in that zero copy fashion. So uh, XNAC isn't enabled by default. And so if a user doesn't realize that they need to do this and how to do it, then they could find this slow um, uh, performance and submit tickets on it. And that's what we've seen. So again, this is something I'd point out uh, to people uh, sort of as a lesson learned that you know, if you're doing this, you could learn from these folks and know to enable this instead of sort of beating your head against it, trying to figure it out. So uh, again, this is a topic that deserves its own um, training. Uh, but we're currently working with AMD, uh, again, to provide some training and documentation on this topic sort of in parallel with the uh, hardware atomic uh, details. And so this should all be available relatively soon for you. Again, if you have questions, feel free to submit tickets. Uh, there's some other common issues. I'm sort of running short on time, so I'll just kind of gloss over these. Uh, these are just, uh, so there's, of course, node failures. Um, this is a TDS system. This is something we're still uh, working on, as Belint uh, mentioned. And so uh, this is something that you should certainly submit uh, uh, tickets on. Uh, if you see this, this is something that's not you know, your fault in your code. This is something that's going on in the system, and we would like to know about it. Um, there, I would like to mention these 
incompatibilities between the HPE software stack and Rockham. So there, we actually recently put a uh, compatibility chart in the docs that you can click on here or find it in the docs in the quick start guide. Um, and it's, it's a, what it says, it uh, shows the compatibility, the expected compatibility with the, you know, the HPE software stack. So things like MPI uh, with Rockham. And the reason for this, that there are these incompatibilities in the first place is that, uh, you know, AMD releases a Rockham release and people are asking us before it's even released, when am I going to get this? And so we want to put it on the system for you right away. Uh, but <clears throat> HPE still needs to work that into their software stack to make it compatible. And so it always just sort of lags behind the latest Rockham on the system. So that latest Rockham is there for you to test things out sort of in a serial fashion. You can run uh, your GPU programs on it, maybe with just a single MPI rank or just serially uh, to test out some things that you might've wanted to know about performance or whatnot, but um, uh, it might not work with the HP software stack uh, quite yet. And so that's something that people submit a lot of tickets about. Uh, there's other things like CMake issues, which deserve uh, some, some points here, but I'm not uh, taking, don't have enough time for that as well as some uh, other issues. But uh, you know, if, if you have issues that you're running into, of course, check the known issue section in the Crusher Quick Start Guide <clears throat> for that. Uh, I won't go through the bullets of summary since we just went through those, uh, but I would point out that the actions from these lessons uh, that the OLCF, ECP, and our vendor partners are taking is to work together to try to deliver documentation and training uh, on these specific issues here, as well as on uh, yeah performance optimization, which will, which will be slightly separate from what I've talked about. Um, we recently started holding Crusher office hours. So every Monday, uh, you can sign up for uh, a particular Monday. We're taking five teams or five issues that they uh, request. You'll move into your own breakout rooms and discuss these issues sort of in a deep dive uh, to try to help you and your team. Uh, and we'll be holding additional Crusher hackathons. Uh, and so, uh, you know, keep an eye out for those things to try to uh, request help in addition to submitting tickets. Uh, and with that, I'm sort of over time, but I can uh, take questions maybe if Blint lets me. Well, I think um, what has been happening is people have been uh, sending lots of questions in the chat and we've been trying to answer them in line. So uh, uh, I think, uh, yeah, okay. So there are some questions about preloading, uh, which we can maybe, that they're very specific. So I think it's something we can do offline, um, but- so. Most of the questions here are, are answered as we go on. So okay. I'll, I'll take a look. And if there's anything I can answer uh, in the chat, I will while the next talk is going on. And I will, uh, maybe we could address them afterward too, if needed. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Tom, uh, for, for the talk. Uh, and uh, I think uh, at this point, we should uh, uh, switch over to Johannes. Is, is Johannes here? I am. Can you hear me? Hi, Johannes. Yes, I can hear you and see you. So okay. I will let you take the screen and uh, go. go you, you're on. Go ahead. All right. Uh, I, tell me if you can see my, my screen. I can, and it's full screen as well. So that's very good. Uh, before right. you start, let me just make a quick, uh, quick comment to the folks who are writing to the chat. Please suggest topics for the panel discussion in the chat as well. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Johan. Be honest. All right. Um, yeah. Also, I'm I'm trying to um, keep the the chat open on my other screen here, but <clears throat> there's uh, there's a danger. I don't uh, see a question, uh, so interrupt me if you if you have an urgent question. Um, all right. So uh, thanks, Belint, uh, for for inviting me, and um, uh, I also want to thank um, my my co-workers here um, they've they've really been uh, doing the bulk of the work so I'm presenting a uh, summary of, of different teams um, uh, experience with um, crusher um, so we all what, what what unites us is that we're all working on a project called exafel and so uh, Felix Whitwer uh, at NERSC has been uh, working on the uh, SFX side and Elliot slaughter at slack and Darren uh, I I don't know if I can pronounce his last name, but Shu, uh, is my approximation um, is, is work at OLCF. Uh, Elliot and Darren are working on the SPI side of it. And just to um, give you some context, what XFL is all about, 
Um, the, the objective here is um, to understand unknown molecular structures um, uh, using X-ray scattering techniques. Um, so at Slack, you have this, this incredibly expensive uh, machine that produces coherent X-ray beams. Um, and, and you can use this beam essentially to, to excite a sample. Um, this is sort of an, an artist's rendering here, but what you can imagine is a X-ray beam comes in, it interacts with a sample. The beam is maybe 10,000 times brighter than the sun locally, so it will destroy your sample, um, but it will uh, lead, before it does, it will create a um, spot pattern on, the, on a detector and then you can read out that detector and using uh, millions of images, you can reconstruct an unknown molecular structure this way. And you can even uh, get insight about um, the uh, chemical interactions in that sample. This is what, what's really about. So then you can ask questions like, you know, does, does a COVID uh, treatment actually interact with a COVID protein and things like that. That's, it's really uh, important science. And, and the important thing here is also the, the instrument time is highly limited. So, this kind of data analysis, it needs to take place as the experiment is ongoing so that scientists are able to make decisions about the experiment. And so um, rather than just being um, an, a single compiled application, XFL is actually a collection of uh, applications that is held together using a Python workflow, which then calls C++, CUDA, HIP, COCOS, kernels um, using Boost Python, PyBind 11, and C types. Um, and that makes it possible for users to interact with it in real time with the experiment. Um, and just um, for as a note here, uh, we're using MPI uh, to, to uh, distribute data in a parallel fashion using a fork join uh, pattern. Um, so the idea is you get a batch of images, you fork join, so you fork across them, you, you iterate uh, with your data analysis, and then you uh, do some reduction operation usually, and that will give you your, your structure. Um, and so the, the, the slightly broader context, just to, to reiterate what, what I said earlier about this being a real-time data processing pipeline, um, is also that it's cross-facility, right? So data is collected at LCLS, and here I'm, I'm sure saying NERSC here, but, but this would also, it would be neat if we could put OLCF here. Um, and so the idea is that this is a, um, a, a a fairly complicated workflow. Um, and um, uh, the important thing here is that there are many different pieces. The compute is maybe down here, but you have uh, services that orchestrate um, the data transfer um, and uh, that also orchestrate the job script creation and submission with the job script scheduler. Um, and so all of this is uh, in order to make sure that the programming model that, that we sort of set up is uh, able to uh, accommodate rapid debugging, but also it needs to be portable from site to site. And, and I, I really want to stress this point here that something that only works at OCF is not really that useful for this kind of um, uh, workflow. All right, so um, getting to some experiences, some, some concrete experiences. Um, uh, I mentioned earlier SFX and SPI. Um, the, the project essentially has um, two scientific directions that are related. SFX is serial femtosecond X-ray crystallography. So the idea is um, you, you analyze uh, Bragg spots on a detector and SPI is, um, actually I forget what it's called, it's single particle imaging, I think. So the idea is um, it, it's a different science and the algorithms are going to be different, but they are part of the same uh, workflow. They're just different modules of it. So the SFX uh, test application is called NanoBrag. Uh, Felix Whitware has been working uh, diligently to port our original CUDA code to, um, uh, to COCOS um, and, and, and our initial experience was, you know, once you get over the fact that every now and then things might not be as, uh, documented as well as, as they could be, but overall, work, COCOS works great. It works great on Perlmutter, it works great on um, Summit, and it works great on Crusher. Um, the uh, figure here has been uh, submitted to the, the 2022 CUG um, uh, conference, which is ongoing right now. And so um, <clears throat> just, just a brief summary, um, the blue line here shows the strong scaling uh, test for 
for the original CUDA code um, and then uh, switching to COCOS uh, without changing the algorithm itself um, already gave us some uh, performance boost. And that's because COCOS is um, actually uh, better than at least our CUDA code at managing uh, memory usage and optimizing the, um, the, the kernel execution parameters. Um, and then uh, when we took this to, to Crusher, uh, we saw a 60% uh, improvement of, uh, so, so the runtime was 60% over uh, Perlmutter phase one. And this is sort of in line with um, knowing what um, uh, the uh, knowing what the, the the available hardware is, you know, uh, essentially we've doubled the number of uh, compute units, so so we have roughly double our throughput. <clears throat> um, there was oh sorry, I see a question here. Um, the Caucus backend is hip. Um, so so we we use the the Caucus hip backend. Um, we also experiment with um, OpenMP. But um, I can't. I can actually speak to to the performance stats on Crusher here because uh, we tend to use OpenMP so that uh, we can do like an an, an an a deployment of this kind of code on a system that doesn't have GPUs. So that's sort of our strategy um, um, as well. Um, all right. Anyway, so uh, one issue that that we did run into is that uh, the file systems were were a bit of an a, a, problem really. Um, so for example, GPFS was not mounted on all the nodes. Um, so, so we had to uh, do, um, uh, we had to kind of struggle a little bit just to collect uh, scaling data here. Um, but I also understand that uh, Cocos, sorry, that uh, Crusher is a system that, um, you know, was uh, made available in an unready state, like, or at least not a final state. So, so, you know, I, Please don't see this as complaining. I'm just giving you feedback here. Um, all right. So uh, moving on to SPI, um, we uh, we found that uh, the porting uh, from CUDA to HIP is, is pretty straightforward, actually. Um, at least from a coding perspective, um, we originally uh, explored HIPify also with a uh, nano brag um, way back when we were using uh, Spark. Um, but we also found that using a, a, like li little tricks like this um, is able to uh, enables us to to uh, do most of the porting as well. Uh, and and the reason why you might want to do something like this is um, the CUDA code is being actively uh, maintained by third parties. Um, so we don't want to start forking um, uh, some of the libraries we want to use. And this is sort of an, an ongoing issue that how do we introduce um, uh, hip-based optimizations in a code that, that's being developed by folks that, that have, don't have access to AMD hardware. And, and I know that this is a problem that, that's known to everyone, but I want to really reiterate this here um, that um, we need to build, uh, we need to have a porting strategy that makes our code, uh, keeps it portable and doesn't fork it from, from uh, third-party library developers. Um, so currently, um, we are working on identifying possible performance issues. Um, uh, so that's ongoing work, and I don't really want to uh, go into specific numbers here. Um, so one example that, that's really worth noting here is uh, the SPI code uses a, a non-uniform fast Fourier transform. So we started with the library called KUFINF, so that's a CUDA-based uh, non-uniform uh, fast, so yeah, non-uniform fast Fourier transform. Um, and it, it was painless to, to get compiling, uh, but then uh, on, on Spock, we did see some issues, uh, sorry, on, 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 um, on Crusher, we saw some issues in the test suite, for example, with hip memset that we didn't see on Spock. So um, we expect this fix to be incoming in uh, with Rockham 5.2. Um, but this is also another sort of theme that we have that um, the uh, Rockham tool chain is, is not as uh, um, mature as the NVIDIA one. And that can sometimes lead to uh, um, issues uh, in, into friction. And finally, also, um, the code seems to uh, have a lower throughput. And, and we're currently working uh, on, on digging deeper into that. And that sort of uh, brings me to uh, the performance debugging tools. Um, 
Uh, overall, the, the Rockham profiler, it does lack a graphical user interface and, and having gotten used to the NVIDIA uh, ANSYS profile and, and said compute um, uh, makes, has made us, um, you know, essentially bemoan the lack of a, a graphical user interface. Um, using the Chrome tracing uh, flame graph tool is, is insufficient as a substitute in our uh, opinion. For example, Chrome doesn't let you look at nested hierarchies of, uh, of kernels and that the inside systems uh, timeline uh, view lets you do. Um, we've also uh, been approached by uh, folks at AMD. Uh, so uh, Jonathan Madsen there is developing OmniTrace. Um, which, which is very closely built on uh, his Timory tool, which, which makes me kind of uh, hopeful that this could be maybe integrated with Hatchet. So that would be kind of neat. And so his tool uh, gives you an output that like the one that you see down here. Um, and um, uh, th that, that tool, you know, it, it's, a, it's a nice uh, other thing that we can work with, but it still lacks a GUI, <laughs> which is a problem. Uh, and, and we haven't really uh, found a way to uh, output memory bandwidth data yet, but, but this is really um, early work that, that Darren's been working on. So, so um, you know, it's, it's probably gonna, we're probably gonna find some interesting uh, uh, new opportunities. Anyway, and then finally, uh, I also want to point out the container runtime. So Spock uses uh, Singularity, which um, this is a really welcome uh, choice uh, because we use containers as a important way to, to do cross-site um, uh, deployment. Um, so we essentially use, we have a very complex dependency uh, network. And so containers is a great way to sort of keep everything together. Um, and we're using, um, so like, Running really simple experiments, we were using um, the, uh, uh, the the official Rock and Docker containers. Um, however, it's a bit clunky. And and here's an example um, from Jan Balewski at NERSC, and he he got help from help at uh, OSCF. Oops, excuse me, I, I have to fix this. Oh, this is not NERSC. <laughs> uh, um, anyway, so what what he found is um, he has to make sure that the Rocker module isn't loaded as well as exporting these variables after some iteration. And so, so there's some work that needs to be done here just to sort of streamline the deployment of uh, containers. Um, and I'm, I'm getting close to the end uh, of, of my uh, 50 minutes. So um, I want to um, finish up with just the key takeaways. And it's it's uh, kind of important that I, uh, I, I stress this again, um, that, that XFL is a cross-site uh, workflow. Um, and so also the, the, uh, the science teams that work um, with experiments like this, they are technical experts in, in uh, very complex experiments. So they, they already need to invest a lot of time and staffing in that part. So they don't, have, they don't actually have the resources to regularly report code. And, and so, um, and this is important because the, the final uh, programming environment for systems like Frontier shouldn't rely on having bespoke code and tools uh, to that data center. Um, I see containers as a possible solution here. I, I left this in a smaller font because this is sort of one possibility, but I don't know whether um, y'all are really wanting to take it that way. Um, and also when it comes to take, getting help, um, we can't always just uh, extract a single kernel and give it to you because it will rely on the overall workflow. Um, and so, um, so we need some some better support models for how to how to um, share components of a difficult or, or large workflow with consultants. Um, overall, we were super happy with Cocos. Um, in part, this is because the data parallel uh, um, analysis pattern works really well with the Cocos parallel four construct, and and Cocos then for free essentially provides us with optimized kernel launch and memory. Uh, uh, man management. Uh, overall about the system, uh, what we find is that the accelerator hardware is great. Um, everything around it though tends to be a bit problematic. So the AMD development tool chain is not as mature as the NVIDIA one. Documentation um, can be more difficult to, to um, navigate um, and the file systems were unreliable. And this is uh, something that's obviously really important for a data centric workflow. Um, and I think I have uh, used my 50 minutes. Um, uh, let me know if, if anyone has any questions. Um, and, and thank you for your attention. 
So thank you very much, uh, Johannes, uh, for this talk. Uh, I think uh, we have one question that just popped up was from, from Yale Wo, which is asking how many kernels are ported via Cocos? Ah, um, so the CUDA uh, nanobrack code, which is the, uh, so essentially this one here, this is, um, that um, was using a monolithic kernel. So uh, now it's it's become maybe three or four. So um, there are two uh, uh, kernels for, for the actual um, simulation part. Um, then there's the man like kernel for managing some um, uh, shared data. And um, finally, we will be porting another set of kernels uh, that, that's sort of next on our to-do list, um, which is a, a gradient descent, a stochastic gradient descent algorithm um, uh, that does some parameter optimization. So currently the answer is three. It's gonna be closer to, I'm gonna say eight, uh, but they're all fairly biggish kernels, right? So, um, uh, I don't know if that, that's what you were uh, asking, but um, it's yeah. You, you amortize the launch overheads and things, basically. Sorry. You, you amortize launch overheads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, with yeah. it. Yeah. So Cocos overheads. I yeah. think that was the, one of the nubs. Okay. Why don't we stop right oh, now? Chuck has his uh, hand up. I'm sorry. Yes. Who has his hand up? Sorry. Uh, I saw Chuck's hand for a moment. Uh, go ahead and ask the question then. Yes. Um, hi. Um, so, um, what are the big differences in uh, the in Frontier and Crusher? Um, obviously, is the uh, the fabric being directly connected to the GPU? And so, um, I'm wondering if uh, you if dealing with data movement um, kind of directly from GPU memory to MPI um, versus kind of shuffling stuff back to the host. Um, if you dealt with any of that in uh, any of your benchmarking or performance um, kind of porting? Um, mm, that's a good question. Uh, currently, this part here uh, is, is very much data parallel. So um, uh, we did not use, um, uh, what is it, MPI direct um, uh, for that. Um, the SPI code um, has the largest potential to benefit from that. And the reason for that is um, the SFX code really is sort of a, a very simple DAG, right? You, you come in, you split across all the images, you do some data analysis, and then you do a reduction. Um, the SPI code, and, and actually some future SFX code will use an iterative loop, right? You, you, you look at the data, you, you turn through some kernels, then you evaluate whether you go another loop around and you, you probably have to exchange between devices some data at that point. Um, so uh, I think in the future, we will be benchmarking this very heavily. Um, at, at present, there's a blocker with SPI with the SPI code um, uh, that, that we have to focus on. And um, the SFX code um, is sort of making steady progress towards becoming more complicated and, and then we will be doing those benchmarks. So, so yet, I guess the answer is not not yet, but definitely in the future. I think one additional comment I can add to that is because the NICs are actually attached to the GPUs. Mm -hmm. If you transfer data to the host, it will just get transferred back to GPUs on its way to the NIC. So yeah. probably you don't want to do that. Uh, yeah. I, right. So and, and we we don't uh, our code isn't planning to to use uh, to 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 stage it on the uh, CPU uh, to begin with, um, so it, it's really just that you know we're starting with the simplest um, um, part of the workflow to to port and then we are getting gradually more complicated. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Thanks. Why don't we pause now? We're about five minutes behind. So why don't we take a five minute break and return at 11.10. So I will share this uh, share screen, share, and I'll say, sorry. I will 
um, because I'm sharing, I lost my uh, controls. So I'll ask Nicholson maybe if he could pause the recording. Uh, oh, thank you, Nicholson. Um, and so our next speaker is going to be uh, Matthew Norman, and he's going to tell us about E3SM MMF application. Uh, please take it away, Matt. Sure thing, thanks. So I'm gonna talk, yeah, about the E3SM MMF. Hopefully you can't see that thing over there. All right. You can see your screen though. Great, okay. So um, I have a list of uh, other people working on this effort on Crusher that I hope is inclusive um, over here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So first I'd like to acknowledge uh, the OLCF and the ECP project um, for the resources that helped achieve the work that's in this presentation. So the E3SM is the Energy Exascale Earth System Model. It's a DOE's high resolution climate model and we have three main science targets, um, the water cycle, hopefully on regional scales, the cryosphere and biogeochemistry cycles. E3SM is composed of five main components that are all coupled together with a coupler. And roughly in terms of decreasing runtime, we have the most expensive as the atmosphere, it's in the ocean model. We have land surface model, land ice and sea ice. <clears throat> And currently, our highest resolution runs that we are running at climate time scales is about 28 kilometers average grid spacing between grid points. Climate in particular is strongly influenced by clouds. They're a dominant source of uncertainty for future climate projections. But we only nominally start to explicitly resolve moist convection at about four kilometer grid spacing. Um, Really, we'd like to have one kilometer or less if we could, but one kilometer grid spacing um, because of time step scaling arguments would be about 22,000 times more computation than we currently do. So clearly that's not something that's feasible today. Even if we had the computing available though, we have this really fast uh, five simulated years per day wall clock um, uh, throughput requirement. Um, that's about 2000 times real time. And when you look at the size of the dynamics time steps that we typically take, um, what this means is the innermost time step of the E3SM needs to <clears throat> complete in the order of milliseconds. And that's including MPI communication and, and, and everything. So it's a unique application because it has to run so fast. Um, and to keep it running so fast, if we strong scale, it means that Every time we refine the grid and increase the node count because of the time step reduction, we end up with less work per node. So there is a limit to how much we can actually refine the model in terms of grid refinement. So what we need ultimately is an algorithmic advancement that allows us to improve cloud resolution and also scale the model out to these uh, larger machines. So the target for E3SM under the ECP project has been the multi-scale modeling framework. It's also known as super parameterization, if anyone is more familiar with that term. What we do in this case is kind of a hybrid between explicit cloud resolution and uh, these heuristic parameterizations that are a bit less accurate. So we embed a high resolution cloud resolving model, as you see over here on the bottom right, at every global model grid point, so that it explicitly simulates clouds in a regime that is forced to be similar to what that grid point is experiencing at a given time, then you aggregate those columns internally into a single forcing for the global model that, that actually explicitly simulates clouds on a reduced domain. Typically, we do this in two dimensions instead of three dimensions. Um, and the other benefit algorithmically is these cloud resolving models, these CRMs, do not communicate directly with one another. They only communicate to the global model. So there's no MPI communication in the vast majority of the uh, floating point operations that we perform. What it also does is provide a self-contained target for GPU acceleration. And we previously ported it with uh, Fortran with directives, OpenACC in this case. Since then, we have moved to portable C++ libraries. And as a quick example of what these cloud resolving models are actually doing, here's a simulation of supercell convection where you can see this vertical velocity here um, 
lifting up water vapor, condensing it into cloud liquid and cloud ice at the model top with some pretty significant um, flow speeds. So that's just a small example of what is actually going on inside the cloud resolving models that we're running inside the global model. So some of the codes that are involved in the RECP porting effort, we have an older, uh, the original cloud resolving model we call SAM++. This is the system for atmospheric modeling that we ported to C++. Then we have a new model that we're developing called PAM, the Portable Atmosphere Model. Um, the benefits of PAM is that it's uh, engineered to be far more modular. So we have a lot more options of what physics we run and when we run them. It has a higher arithmetic intensity than the previous model and fewer kernels. Um, each kernel is larger and it has a more flexible time stepping strategy that allows us to change how frequently we call the expensive physics. We also have the rapid radiative transfer model for GPUs in parallel in C++, that's a mouthful, RRTMGP++. This does radiation transport in a vertical column. Um, we have the model for prediction across scales applied to the ocean in pass O. Um, all of these codes are either using or plan to use the uh, yet another kernel launcher portable C++ library. I'll get more into that in a little bit. Um, we also have the, this two-moment microphysics scheme called P3 and a macrophysics or subgrid scale scheme called SHOCK. And these have been ported with COCOS. Um, you can see a link here to, to those codes. Um, and we have been able to seamlessly integrate the YACL and COCO C++ portability libraries. That was not really a problem for us. So what is uh, YACL in particular? Many of y'all are familiar with COCOS already, so I won't go too deep into that. But YACL is also a C++ portability library. It's significantly smaller. The core code is only about 5,000 lines. And it's been developed with very little effort, just one to one and a half FTEs. Um, some of the things that are interesting about YACL in particular is it allows Fortran-like behavior in the resulting C++ code. Um, so this makes porting Fortran code significantly faster um, and less bug prone because you don't have to permute the order of the indices or change how they're indexed. Uh, we can do column major ordering if we want with arbitrary lower bounds that default to one, just like Fortran. And there is a growing library of Fortran intrinsic functions. So we have to change the loop syntax, but the code inside the loop by and large looks identical to the original Fortran. And we also in Yakko have an efficient pool allocator that is automatically enabled for all array creations and allocations. What this does is allows us to have frequent allocation and deallocation. And I'll give a little bit more information on that later. Uh, Yakko has an emphasis on simple readable syntax um, with minimal developer concerns. We do simplify the uh, capability set compared to Raja and Cocos, and that allows us uh, to um, keep the developer from having to think about these things. The other side of that coin is if you really want to use all the bells and whistles of a C++ portability library, um, Yakko is probably not the best choice in that case. It's really meant for Fortran style coding that we're moving directly over to C++. It runs on CPUs, CPU threads with OpenMP um, and NVIDIA, AMD and Intel GPUs using CUDA, HIP and SICL respectively. So some quick results uh, with the portable atmospheric model. This is a simplified version. We do have benchmarks with um, cases with more complex physics, but uh, we only recently got those results. Um, so I don't have them for you right now, but um, with we still have a lot of the cloud resolving model-like aspects with uh, this benchmark of PAM. And generally we always see an improvement of an MI100 over V100, and we always see an improvement of MI250X over MI100. As you increase the workload, um, the number of grid points here, you can see that the speed up generally increases. Um, it, it monotonically increases uh, over the V100. It, at the peak, we get about two times speed up over V100, which is a little better than that 1.8x um, increase in high bandwidth memory that you saw on Tom Papadopoulos' slide. So this indicates that you know, CFD is typically a memory bandwidth bound um, type of algorithm. And 
since we show similar improvements to the aggregate increase in memory bandwidth, it, it indicates that we have done our porting effort uh, effectively. We also have a mini app uh, that we'd like to use to gauge other aspects of performance. So it's called Mini Weather. You can see a, a link there. Um, unlike the cloud resolving models, this actually has MPI communication. And as we increase the problem size on this x-axis, uh, these are both log scale, uh, we can see that uh, at the largest problem size we ran, we have a uh, 72x on node speed up that's comparing all the GPUs to all the CPUs on node. Um, and again, that's a little better than the aggregate memory bandwidth improvement you see on the eight MI5250X GCDs. So some of the lessons learned from our optimization efforts, uh, we have a lot of kernels and we have uh, to run extremely fast. So we have very small per node workloads. Many of these kernels are running between one and 10 microseconds, which is of the same order of magnitude as the launch overhead itself. So one mitigation strategy we have that is we launch all these kernels. And, and honestly, we have hundreds of kernels and tens of thousands of lines of code that we're launching launch all the kernels asynchronously in the same stream. And what that does is it overlaps the kernel launch overheads with kernel execution and gives quite a bit of speed up compared to synchronous launching. We also merge kernels where we algorithmically are able to do so without accruing too much code and getting register spillage. Uh, again, the, um, we do frequent allocations and deallocations in these codes that have been ported, and we really have to rely on Yakult's pool allocator for this. Not only does this uh, save memory usage, but um, it keeps the variables properly scoped rather than having to have them in some sort of global scope. They're only created where they are needed. Um, we had to pay particular attention to the launch bounds operator um, in HIP, uh, and I believe CUDA as well. It defaults to the largest number of threads per block um, because it doesn't know how many you're gonna run. And so you don't wanna get wrong answers. What this does is it allocates fewer registers per thread. And that leads to spillage, which leads to very poor performance uh, in your resulting kernels compared to if you had not spilled registers. So YAKL has a default launch bounds of 256, which by default matches the number of threads per block. So we cannot allow that uh, wrong answer bug. And um, we expose this through a simple templated object that you just pass by parameter with the parallel four. Um, GPU aware was very important for the mini weather application. In most of the problem sizes, we had more than 1.3x speed up, which is pretty significant. So if you can, you should try to use GPU aware MPI, but be aware that it does not synchronize with, its, with respect to existing asynchronous device work. So if you launch a bunch of kernels, you should not expect the GPU aware MPI to synchronize before performing the copies. Um, so you have to do that yourself. That's something we found out. We do have issues with hardware atomics, similar to what you heard on Tom's, uh, saw on Tom's slides, um, but we expect these to be resolved very soon. Um, so no worries there, I don't think. The last thing I'll cover with the last couple of minutes of the 15 minutes is we, we have been seeking bitwise reproducible results, which means if you take the same executable and run it multiple times, you get exactly the same floating point answer at the end. We need this in climate because climate has nonlinear chaotic divergence of initially small fields, uh, which is the reason your weather prediction can never get really beyond two to three weeks. Um, if you have fields that are just machine precision difference, even double precision machine precision difference, 10 to the minus 15, um, it will expand into completely different weather states within just a couple of weeks. So we it's hard to test and answer uh, uh, the, the quality of your climate simulation when that sort of thing's happening. So we really like to have bitwise reproducible results so that if someone alters the code, we can say, yes, this uh, will change the answer. And then we have to do some runs and bless uh, those changes before we allow them into the main branch to ensure that we are continuing to have a quality climate simulation. Um, and Yakul enables this by um, we only really have to worry about the atomic add instruction. Uh, we're using HipCub, which is built on rock prim for all of our reductions and scans, and that already guarantees determinism. So we didn't have to worry about those, thankfully. But atomic add, you can't guarantee what order threads are going to be executed and how they're going to write to memory. So um, for anything that has atomic add, the user 
just adds this parameter you see down here at the bottom, yakl default launch config bit for bit. Um, just add that to the end of your parallel four call and pass this dash D yakl bit for bit flag when you're testing. And it will cause all allocations to use hit mallet manage, and it will kick all of these kernels that are flagged off to the CPU to run in serial so that you're guaranteed the operations perform in the same order. Um, if you do not pass this yakl bit for bit flag, then it runs non deterministically and efficiently, just like you would expect. So that's all I have. Um, I will open it up for questions from here. And thanks for your time. Thank you, Matt, for that uh, great talk. Um, I saw a couple of questions in the chat. I guess um, there's a question really uh, that was there is, uh, Matt, does an asynchronous launch not block for at least the same duration as the kernel launch latency? Um, so yeah, if, if, if you were to launch every kernel if you were to wait until every kernel returns before you launch the next, then uh, you know clearly you, you would get no benefit from this. But with the immediate return, we do have some kernels that are running at 50 to 100 microseconds, while some kernels are running at one microsecond. So when you sum it all together, launching them all initially does end up overlapping at least some of the kernel launch overheads with kernel execution. Um, not all the kernels are, are, are so small. Some of them are running on the order of 200 to 300 microseconds. I hope that answers your question. Looks like it did. Okay, do we have any other questions for Matt? Yeah, feel free to speak up. I can't look at the chat. At yes. So there's one here from Konstantinos. So how much of the E3SM code is still in Fortran and how much is in C++? How are future science updates expected to be developed, et cetera? Um, so we have multiple ish, uh, projects going on internally. Uh, we have our effort where relatively little of the code is running on the GPU. We have the radiation code, RTMGP, and the cloud resolving model code. So we're talking tens of thousands of lines among a code base that's one to two million lines of code. But all of the flops and memory accesses are, are, are centralized into these cloud resolving models. That's why we're able to run effectively on GPUs with this particular use case. We have another effort called SCREAM, um, Simplified Cloud Resolving E3SM Atmospheric Model. And this effort is running at much lower throughputs with a much higher resolution atmosphere. They're actually running at, a, I think the target is three kilometers. And they have simplified physics because you don't need all of the, the global climate model physics for grid spacings that small. So they have this two moment P3 microphysics, this shock scheme, and maybe a couple extra added. Those are already ported with Cocos and running efficiently on NVIDIA and AMD GPUs. Um, and they are just working on getting the, the driver and coupler ported over to C++. So, that particular use case has a large, has a much smaller volume of code, and it will all run on GPUs uh, from the start. Um, regarding the traditional atmospheric simulation without MMF and without Scream, uh, most of that is still not running on the GPU because the um, the MPI overheads are so large that honestly, for a lot of the code, GPUs will only slow things down because of um, the increase in latency cost. So the two, target, the two targets of E3SM that are looking for GPU are Scream and MMF. There's a comment here from Sarat. Uh, in the broader E3SM project, not just the MMF yeah, that, framework. It is to... That's an answer to constant nose. <laughs> so, oh, okay, I see. <laughs> I see, okay. So then uh, do we have any more questions for Matt? Please speak up because I can't see all the attendees. So I can't see necessarily people's hands are up. Okay, so at this point, then why don't we why don't we thank all our speakers again, uh, and then we should move on to the discussion part of this uh, session. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, I've been sent a couple of topics uh, from from our um, our audience, and I thought what we could do maybe is that uh, for the speakers, uh, you know, we could just mention the topic and then we could bounce it around all the speakers 
you know, uh, Matt, uh, Johannes, uh, Tom, and also Corbin and, and Tim. So the first comment I got, and this was partially answered in the in the chat, but I'd like the, the speakers and our vendors to take a more general view is about the AMD two, uh, MI250X and its matrix uh, instructions. Uh, so this was a question I think about how to access them, but I think we can broaden out the discussion to uh, whether you think they would be useful to you in your code and uh, and whether there's a chance of, uh, you know, somehow thinking about perhaps performance portability amongst uh, the various uh, matrix operations out there, both between the current AMD and also maybe uh, the NVIDIA tensor operations and so on. So let me just uh, ask first, uh, what uh, Tom would think about this. Well, I don't have an application of my own uh, that's going to use these. Um, so I'm not really uh, maybe going to answer that question and leave it off to uh, some of the other folks. I mean, I think that right now it works with, or maybe what we could do is just sort of look at what people are doing on uh, Summit with, with those matrix cores, right? So. Yes, uh, they're being they're being used through the libraries mostly. And there are a handful of people, just like the comment said, uh, that are able to get in and you know dig in themselves into the specific code. But I think that uh, you know as long as they're being used in the um, uh, libraries where possible, then that's a good starting point for people. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, how about uh, Johannes? Any thoughts? Um, yeah, um, I think the first thing that comes to mind um, is <clears throat> that um, the, the area of um, data analysis and data intensive computing um, is, you know, starting to actively embrace machine learning. Um, and I mean, I mentioned uh, gradient descent methods uh, earlier. Um, and so while we currently, at least for the X, XFL project, don't really have, and we are not really using these, these um, operations um, uh, a lot, I can see that in the future, we will probably be uh, embracing a lot of machine learning uh, libraries, which will make heavy use of us. Uh, so I'm kind of, I guess I'm, I'm kind of passing the buck to the, uh, to the machine learning folks, you know, make sure that you use them correctly. <laughs> but yeah, um, I think, but, but I also think that that's, that's the approach taken by many um, uh, data intensive compute projects. Okay, thank you, Johannes. Uh, Matt, any comments? Do you think you could use them in E3SM? Uh, we don't do a lot of uh, DGEM type operations or, you know, dense matrix multiplies. Uh, so I, I have to agree that I think machine learning is probably our best path to using that particular hardware feature. Okay, thank you. So for the a vendor perspective, uh, Tim, uh, any thoughts from your side? Yeah, the um, my understanding about those instructions is that they were really geared to be there for the math library people to target. Uh, they were not designed to be used by just your regular developers. So I would definitely say, at least for the, the foreseeable future, that uh, those matrix multiply uh, or matrix instructions of the hardware uh, really should be left to being accessed through uh, math libraries. Um, it, it, it just the complexity of being able to to reference them and use them is just so high when there are so many other things you need to get right to get good performance that uh, I think it's it's not necessarily the best use of your time to try to target them. I see. Uh, I see. Thank you, Tim and uh, Corbin. Uh... Yeah, so the, the built-in operations are are there, right? You know, there's it's not hiding from anyone. You can go into um, the LLVM source and, and look at how, um, you know, look at the actual operations. 
Um, if you, they are, uh, I put a comment in the chat, they're, they're built into the rock blahs um, and there's also uh, kind of heavily under development, the rock WMA library. And so those, those kind of use those operations in the back end. Um, you are are welcome to to pull out the internals and 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 implement them. And uh, there was a talk um, with Tim Warburton and Noel Chalmers where they they actually implemented them in um, Hipbone, I think, and and got good performance with them. Um, but you know that was work. Noel Chalmers is, is an AMD software engineer, so he knows the the internals and all that. So he was able to um, you know he knows how the the lay, the data layouts need to be and things like that. Um, the only thing I will say is. Um, using the built-ins directly uh, will have kind of inherent risk um, because they could kind of the ground could kind of shift under your feet at any point because the you know the, the general development cycle is um, if there's a change you know they expect everyone to be using them through the libraries and so um, you know ideally the library API won't change but the built-ins could change and so the ground kind of shift under your feet um, and so the, the kind of development um, ideology is, you know, we only have to fix the library, the people using the libraries versus, you know, n number of people, uh, n number of problems, you know, people uh, using their own built-in operations. So if, if you want to use them um, kind of as is in, in like a um, an ad hoc way, you know, shoot me a note, I, I'm happy to help you get up and running with them. But, um, you know, using the built-ins straight from the source um, is going to be complicated. Thank you, Corbin. So uh, I know that this is a crusher early experiences buff, but uh, this is a, just a because I see in our audience many people who are interested in, in the performance portability, I was going to open this up for comments from our friends who uh, work with Cocos or who work with uh, C++ standards, uh, whether they want to comment about the potential for potential for standardizing some of these operations. Do any comments from the audience on that front? Maybe Kate, Damien, uh, Christian? What do you mean standardizing the metric stuff or? Yeah, so so I've been hearing hearing a lot about, you know, uh, standard laws definitions in the standard and whether access to these kinds of matrix operations could become standard and efficient in the future. So in principle, yes, right? So the standard blast effort, right? Um, it's it's MD span based, right? But what that means is that the blast operations can get the information about things like compile time extents. You know, but you that you can essentially have a four by four matrix multiplied, right? On top of it, it supports uh, mixed precision. So in principle, in principle, right, a compiler vendor or 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 a an implementer of a C++ standard library, right, when that thing is in, could say, okay, if you call std blast, uh, you know, metrics, metrics product, and you have, uh, you know, two 16-bit matrices, yes, no, as input, and a 32-bit matrix as output, and it's all four by four or whatever, or whatever the metric size is, right, then it would uh, map directly to that thing, right? Or we could, you know, larger operations, right, we could under the hood, uh, you know, like uh, use these use these instructions, right? So this uh, you know split it up into these smaller operations, right, etc. So there's the direct mapping if all the arguments map what the hardware can do, right? And there's the indirect mapping what already some of these uh, higher level libraries do, right? Where we use the things underneath. So I think that's the way how this would work from a standard perspective, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so then uh, time is passing on. Uh, uh, let's move on to another topic that was brought up. Uh, and this was uh, uh, brought up uh, was a question about experiences with profiling tools. And I think there was a partial answer here already in the comments from, from Tim and Trey. But why don't we open the discussion about, about things like uh, profiling tools uh, to to our to our panel. So uh, as usual, first I will ask for comments. Uh, I'll ask Tom. So I think um, Paul's question what was specifically about user experiences with it, right? Yes. Um, yes. I think Trey did mention that there is going to be an upcoming talk um, about that uh, about 
using it, right, but not what users are saying or how they're experiencing it, I guess um, I would say that uh, there is certainly a desire for documentation on it. Uh, I mean, I know that there is a little bit of documentation, but um, you know, this is also something that we're working on to put into the to put into the quick start guide. Uh, but having better documentation, I think, is basically the one thing that people are are looking for. There's people who have said similar things uh, that was mentioned earlier about, um, uh, I guess, just the maturity or you know, being able to visualize it in Chrome uh, versus a, a standalone app where you can do things like overlapping uh, profiles, stuff like that. Um, but I think that a big step in the right direction would just be understanding what uh, some of the, I guess the documentation would be, right, just sort of basic usage. And then on top of that, maybe uh, something about the counters that are sort of commonly used to, to collect the, the what's common among the most important uh, aspects or, or specific counters or whatnot. I think that, um, I know that's, Sort of application specific, um, but just basic guidelines, I guess, plus basic usage would be helpful in general for people as a starting point. And then, of course, they could always dive in deeper during some of these talks, like um, uh, like Trey's going to be giving. Yes, indeed. And I should also point out that there was um, a tutorial yesterday about roof lining, which may be of, of interest to, to some, which had a component about roof line on AMD as well as the other vendors' uh, GPUs. So I suspect that this will be available in the future via recording if it isn't already. Uh, but be, uh, so let's then move on and let me ask uh, Johannes. Uh, you, you already mentioned that in your talk that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, with NVIDIA tools, you feel kind of a little bit spoiled, maybe, and uh, and perhaps uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, better tools could be available. Do you want to elaborate that? Uh, yeah, um, I think uh, I want to also build on um, the, the 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 statement that um, the the Chrome uh, tracing is sort of uh, insufficient, and that is um, we are. Um, frequently just exporting our inside uh, traces uh, to database or JSON format. And then and we have a bunch of scripts that can do analysis like um, how do different NPI ranks, you know, like uh, an, an overlapping kernel execution, how does the all of that um, affect performance? And, um, and, and that is also not really um, uh, that easy with, with Rockham. Uh, and, and that's also why I mentioned Hatchet, because I think the Hatchet folks are, um, are onto something interesting here. Um, I think they're also at Oak Ridge, right? Um, and, and, and they're basically saying, well, we are going to build a bunch of different connectors to different um, profiling tools. And then we, we provide you with a Python uh, interface that lets you then write your own data analysis scripts and the post-processing scripts. And so I really want to encourage um, this kind of development, you know, not only at, at a GUI and, and it's not the fact that uh, I don't want to, I wanna, don't, don't want to sound, make it sound like I don't want to use Chrome. It's it's a fact that the, 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 the GUI is much richer and lets you do filtering and lets you export certain things uh, and, and lets you do more powerful data analysis. And, uh, and how about Matt, your thoughts? I, the, the hardest thing with uh, profiling for us was getting metrics on the kernel, particularly register usage and spillage. You have to dump out the assembler and, you know, grep through it. And, you know, it, it would be nice if we could couple that in kind of like uh, MVProf does or, or Insight where you have the, the, the runtime metrics, you know, and you click on the kernel and it tells you what actually happened with that kernel, how many threads were launched and stuff and how many registers. The other thing is, and this is hardly specific to HIP, is the Lambda name angling. I really wish that would improve in some manner. I, I don't know what it would take for that, but you know, just some sort of, you know, hierarchy, and then maybe a line number or, or anything. But it's we 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 do have our hooks to to Rockham's version of NVTX uh, to label these things with the label you pass to Parallel Four, but um, it it's not enough uh, to to very easily get what we want to know about specific kernels, especially when we have hundreds of them that we're parsing through. 
Okay, so let me ask for the vendor perspective on this, and then I'll come back afterwards to ask if anyone has tried other other tools like Tau or, or any of the other things. But first, let me ask him uh, about about his thoughts. Okay, um, first off, uh, that more and better tools are coming, uh, as 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 people have already said many times. That Crusher is a very early access. Uh, to uh, all the different tool chains and so forth. And the Cray performance analysis tools are uh, quite well received when you are able to use them on a Cray system. And since this is a Cray system, you will have access to them. And uh, there is very rapid and active development getting them able to use all the uh, uh, performance counters that are coming out of the GPUs, this particularly the AMD GPUs. And there's been some recent developments in that. Um, unfortunately, I can't demonstrate it yet. Uh, and I can't give you necessarily a time frame, but uh, be on the lookout for uh, much better profiling tools from HPE side. Uh, and I've also, I will leave it to the AMD person to talk about it, but I have seen demos of a much more advanced tool from AMD that they are working to get released, but I don't know the timeframes on that either. Uh, but yes, uh, profiling, I'm, I'm a performance engineer, so uh, it's very important to be able to look at the internals of what's going on. And yes, we know this is a, an area of concern. Um, it's just a matter of, it takes time to get all this stuff functioning and uh, and released, so. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, Corbin, your thoughts? Yeah, so um, AMD does have an internal roof line type tool that we're in the process of rolling out. Um, I don't have a, a time frame for when that, um, but it's it's that is in the process of being, um, being released. We, um, most of our effort has been on basically providing API and hooks for for some of these third party tools, um, you know, like HPC toolkit and, and things like that. Um, there are there are efforts, um, you know, within AMD still to provide, um, you know, better visualization. But um, it seems like the community and, and most of what the interest is, um, uh, you know, in terms of portability and, and having kind of like a unified uh, set of tools is, is to pipe this data in through um, a lot of these third-party tools, and uh, I, you know, I believe that's where most of the the effort is is going into, um, kind of in the next, you know, the the next kind of work cycle. Okay, thank you, Corbin. And in the meantime, we have some messages coming up uh, in the chat. Uh, Kevin Huck was saying that Tau is available on Crusher, and it uses the Rock Profiler and Rock Chaser libraries that are available from HIP. It's built on top of that, and it will give you per kernel metrics like register counts and block sizes. Um, and then Sarat Sripati uh, was saying that you know if you're using Cocos, Cocos actually does have a profiling API. It's a pretty decent start, uh, and uh, it can it can require maybe a little bit more integration and cleanup. And then, of course, there's a little discussion after that that uh, um, that uh, there are, are sort of personnel issues involved in continuing that. Um, I see. So I've got some more questions. Uh, there's this question from Konstantinos saying, "What's the story with AMD Microprof?" The latest version claims to handle GPU performance counters in addition to CPU ones. Corbin, do you want to add to that? Or Noah? Yeah, uh, I guess I can feel that. Okay. Um, so the question is AMD Microprof. Um, it's primarily CPU focused, right? It has a lot of the counters for um you know specifically focusing on cpu performance it has attempted to pull in some you know it's leveraging those same hooks from you know what hpc toolkit and others are using to pull in that gpu data alongside it um it's still i guess preliminary um some of us internally have done some testing but nothing too um, extensive uh, but the goal is to you know with that approach to have one central place for doing you know 
CPU and GPU profiling. I'm not sure how extensive it will be in the future. Um, so again, still, you should also consider those third-party tools. Um, this is just another example, something you can sort of kick the tires with and see how far you can get with it. Okay, thank you very much, Noah and Corbin. Uh, I was gonna return to this topic. Uh, do any of our, our, our developers on the panel, Matt uh, or, or Johannes, have you had any experiences with like Tau or any of, I, I guess Johannes, you already mentioned uh, Hatchet. Um, yeah, uh, I haven't used Tau um, or, or AMD Micro Profiling, but um, we are using uh, Hatchet at the moment to parse all of our per rank Python profiler and Timory. So we also use Timory. I don't know. Um, so actually, uh, folks at AMD might know Jonathan Madsen. He developed Timory while he was at NERSC. Um, and so that's been our tool for um, memory and workflow data analysis, uh, sorry, perform performance analysis. <clears throat> okay, and, and Matt, any thoughts from you? I have not used those tools, um, but for context, my idea of an IDE is VI plus control Z. So uh, I have to spin up on some of these latest and greatest things. And in terms of profiling, do you uh, deal with the counts directly or, or do you have a, some kind of post analysis tool that you like to shove them through or just... uh, We use RockProf. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we... So yeah, ge generally the, these counters in roof lines are, are not telling us anything we didn't already know. Um, and we have structured the kernels in such a way that all memory accesses are, uh, are coalesced. So. There, there's just not much for us to, to generally do unless we see something like register spillage. Okay, thank you, Matt. I see in the comments uh, on the chat also, Sarat mentioned that in E3SM effort, we have used Tau over many, many years and love it. And then, then Johannes agrees with you, but uh, he adds Jupiter next to him. Uh, so uh, at this point, I think these were all the topics that have been suggested. Uh, we have about seven minutes till the end of this session. Um, I was going to just ask if there are any, any more questions or comments from the audience. Uh, uh, I, I, again, let me quickly zip through and see if I can see any raised hands. Uh, I, I don't know how to raise my hand right now. Oh, wait, oh, here. I think raise it here. Here, I found it. OK, go uh, ahead, Christian. I consider your hand raised. But, so one thing, one other thing, you know, in particular with, with respect to MI250, right, where I think we need to figure out how also, uh, and, and profiling tools to figure that out, right? My understanding is that certain things on MI250 and actually quite a lot of things on MI250 are power limited, right? So there's way more hardware there than can actually be used at the same time, right? And so you, you end up power limited, you end up frequency, you know, reduced and stuff like that, uh, which means that you don't reach, you know, maximum throughput floating point and, and whatnot, right? How do we figure stuff like that out in the, in the profilers, right? How, how do we see, how do we see that's what's happening here, right? Uh, and that's why we don't get the kind of expected throughput, right? And is that something where there is a difference between, you know, compute units and uh, and uh, bandwidth? And the other thing, uh, there's lots of tools which are focused on floating point, right? And like the roof line and whatnot, right? But the vast, vast majority of the codes I've seen do significantly more integer operations than floating point operations. And the fact that there is, is not small, right? Sure, there's some where we have about the same integer as floating point, but there's, there's, there's lots of codes, lots of kernels where we have six to seven times more integer throughput. So I would really want to see more focus on that, right? Okay, thank you. Any, any comments from our vendors? Uh, how about uh, uh, Corbin? Well, I can take a swing at this one. So okay. um, that, that's a great question. Um, we're getting to the point where we have to pull in, you know, power and frequency into our analysis to see, you know, is that a limiter in our performance? And so, you know, we sort of gave that sort of baseline 
what our take is on the roof line uh, in Monday's morning session. And so right now, what we're sort of releasing is the standard roof line approach where you're considering bandwidth and flops. Um, but we also provided that example where, you know, you're also limited specifically by the type of flops you're doing. And then that end body example, we considered our transcendental functions. We had an inverse square root where, you know, on hardware, your adds, your multiplies don't run at the same rate as a transcendental. It's at a lower rate. So if you have transcendentals on your, your, your critical path, you're going to have a different limit on the performance you can achieve. And so one thing we're considering towards that um, same thought process that Christian is mentioning is, you know, power and thermals are going to be on the critical path. They're going to, depending on your workload, right? If you're doing dense gems and you're just relentless on filling that um, MFMA pipeline, you know, you're, you're going to be saturating uh, power. And you're going to have a, a throttling of your, your compute clock. So we're, we're trying to devise a new methodology expanding sort of the roof line and see what we can do to give you more insight into what is your your true limiter of performance. And it's gonna be multiple pieces. It's not gonna be a clean 2D plot. We might have to move to a multi-dimensional space. Um, but yeah, you, you have a good point that there are now multiple you know, things that can affect performance and it's important to, to study them all. Thank you very much. Uh, I also know in the comments that, that Kevin Hart mentioned that Tau uh, is also integrated with Rockham SMI now, so it can get power utilization stats at runtime as well. So at this point, uh, we are coming up to the top of the hour, and I don't know if this stream will automatically cut off or, 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 or how it will go. So I would like to uh, bring these uh, proceedings here to the close for the day. I would like to thank uh, our speakers very much. Uh, I would like to thank our panel members, especially as well, and everyone from the audience who has contributed questions, discussion topics, or, or uh, helpful answers. So thank you all very much. And thank you again for attending this session. Uh, have a great day. Enjoy well, the rest of that, the I meeting. would actually like to, to address one. There was an additional question that came in on the chat. Uh, go ahead. Yes. Go we've ahead. Been we've been got at least about, two minutes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've been saying that Crusher is an early access system, and that's what it is. Uh, and the maturity of the tool set and so forth is just not where people are used to when you're using, uh, say, an NVIDIA tool set. But it, it, the, the difference is in many years of development on just the maturity of things. So I cannot say that, hey, it'll be ma more mature in June and, and things will just be perfect in June. Uh, but I see uh, in the work I've been doing for uh, my own uh, performance uh, profiling and, and benchmarking efforts that uh, the compiler itself, just the compiler, has had dramatic improvements since like November uh, to today. And uh, just things where the, um, the tool chain just hasn't been exposed yet to real codes until just recently. And so uh, all the different engineers are frantically working through filing tickets saying, hey, uh, yeah, the simple case works, but when I give this more complicated kernel, uh, the compiler falls over and starts spilling registers all over the place. And uh, it gets sent in and they work on it and comes back and say, okay, we've, we've found the root cause and that'll be out in the next version of Rockham, or whatever it is. Well, it still takes time for that to percolate through. And so like, for instance, the, the thing about the, uh, the unsafe atomic floating point uh, operations, uh, it was only recently discovered that there was a, a, a glitch in you know, the, a particular case where it wasn't doing what we were expecting. And the fix for that is coming in Rockham 5.2. But you know, we're still trying to get Rockham 5.1 to work with the HPE tools. And so it, this is just, a, it's, it's the first existence of this machine, you know, of, of this architecture. And so it just takes time. Um, and I cannot promise when things will be perfect, 
uh, if they ever will be. But uh, you know, we're, we're dealing with the first time all of these different parts have been put together. So uh, I'm sorry to say, I'd like to ask you for some patience, but submit your bug reports when you find problems and uh, they're being worked on. And I would like to echo that. Uh, thank you very much for that comment, Tim. That's a very important comment. And I think you know the best way to help the maturation of the tools is to submit tickets and to submit uh, reproducers with them, because it's only with the, the kind of reproducers that these problems typically can get fixed. I mean, they can be tracked by other means, but it's easiest to act on them if, if you submit a reproducer with your tickets. Right. Yeah, I will. I will say that. Um... If you have a problem, please submit bug tickets. That makes our lives a lot easier to, you know, we, we hear anecdotes of, uh, you know, this happened or uh, then trying to hunt down ghost, ghost bugs is, is very difficult. So um, if you have, a, if you have like a, an actual, just even a few sentences of what's going on and how to, how to get there, um, a ticket makes things a lot easier to, to kind of get our hands around. I might as well echo that too and just say that, uh, you know, I do hear people say, um, okay, well, I guess I'll just wait for the software stack to mature. So, well, <laughs> yeah, please, please uh, don't that, do that. That's how, that's how you get your issues fixed. And it is possible, like they said, that you do have, you know, similar issues that come in uh, that could fix your problem. But it's also possible that you're waiting through all these software releases for it to get fixed. And if you don't, you know, submit that ticket, then uh, it may be something that's not found because it's, you know, there's only a handful of people it's affecting or something. Well, and that's, I mean, that's how we set our work plans, right? You know, we, we get a list of tickets and we, we set, you know, rack and stack things based on priority. So if, um, if they're, you know, if you have a, a bug that's not in there, um, you know, there's a possibility that it never makes it on the, on the work plan. If I may ask a quick question. So if we have some tickets open with OLCF and, something is being worked on at AMD, but it's not transparent to us. I guess, how do we follow up? I mean, we can send periodic reminders, but that doesn't. <laughs> uh, so so I, think, I think my understanding as a, as a liaison who's you know, had, had people talk to me about this is that typically if there is no answer, it's because the problem hasn't been fixed. But I also know that if there is feedback from the vendor about a ticket to LCF, uh, then usually the user assistant staff who are dealing with that ticket will make a comment and inform you uh, unless there is something NDA that prevents them. And, but if you, so, so I, it, this does happen, I've seen it happen, that, uh, but it can happen that the OLCFN is fallow for a while. So in that case, you, know, you can feel free to check on it. Um, you can always feel free to uh, uh, ask someone like Tom or myself, but sometimes it's just because it takes a long time to fix certain issues. Uh, yeah. Tom, I, please comment on this. Yeah, I mean, I would really just echo the same thing. So I, I would just say um, <clears throat> that we are following up with the uh, tickets on that side. I know you can't see that. So that yeah. maybe can be. Yeah, I meant, uh, I didn't mean OLCF isn't communicating quickly. I guess, I mean, how do we get AMD to respond quickly, I guess? <laughs> so. Oh, well, I mean, that's that's what we're doing is to drive, yeah. drive things okay. from our side. Um, yeah. But anytime that you're curious about what's going on, just, yeah. you know, Feel free to ask and say, you know, hey, you know, I haven't heard anything about this. Is it because there's not an update or you're not telling me something? Yeah. Uh, you know, and we're always happy to respond and let you know. So, um, but we are, we are driving these things from our side and we do have, you know, bug meetings as well to make sure that things are uh, properly escalated and whatnot. So uh, it is definitely something we're, we're keeping up on on our side. I, I will, you know, keep driving home the, the more detailed of a, an explanation and a reproducer you can make the faster things get fixed um you know generally um if if something is um you know i see something happen sometimes on some systems um you know please help me fix it uh that is going to sometimes sit um until there's um kind of more of like a, an ability to, to get our hands on it and and feel free to submit things that don't you know they're intermittent issues. Uh, I've submitted tickets to uh, HPE and AMD that, you know, I basically show, look, I just ran this 10 times and it only happened two of the times, 
but having a reproducer and knowing ahead of time that it's only going to reproduce this percentage of a time roughly will allow them to then go through and, and test it in that with that mindset as opposed to um okay well i ran it nothing happened what, <laughs> what, what's going on so you know all that extra detail of you know the, how often it happens the build instructions that sort of thing is certainly helpful and can get you more immediate help right yeah we're, we're definitely happy to iterate on you know if you have a, a semi reproducer that you say you know this is all that i have at the moment but you know it gives some i mean that's that's exponentially better than um you know something happens sometimes in some places <laughs> And the other thing is, I guess, while small and easily understandable reproducers are best, sometimes that's not easy to do. And you might have to say, okay, look, here's the whole app. And that's all I can do. That can also happen. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's uh, small reproducers are, of course, easier to analyze and work with. But sometimes, you know, you have environment like, like uh, Tom mentioned, and the environment can involve particular input files uh, or, or, or even larger runs. So, uh, what, but it's, it's always better than, than no reproducer, right? So just saying it doesn't work for me on this case is, is, is not really actionable. So that's, that's important is that, is that our vendor partners and our user assistance team have, have information that they can act on, I would say. Since we're talking about reproducers, um, uh, do, do you have a plan? I mean, like there's, there's an opportunity here, right? Because, um, you're offering a singularity. Um, so do you have a plan where in the future a user could just say, here's my image um, and here's my job script. Um, and, um, and, and you can work on um, using that. Um, or or is, that, is that considered too unwieldy for the consulting staff? So I, I can't possibly comment, Tom. Um, I mean, if it's possible. Uh, I guess you could do it, right? There's some places where it is and isn't. It's not really very possible on Summit right now. We're just getting right, right, right. Work there. But for, um, you know, if that is something that you could offer, then that, I don't see what the issue would be there. Um, right. If you can reproduce it, right? right. Um, it may be that some things need to be changed because, if, you know, somebody submits a reproducer and says, hey, this is my module list. I'm you know, running into this issue with this particular code, you know, mm -hmm. compile and run it, it may be that I want to uh, change which modules are loaded to say, okay, well, let me check this newer or later version to see if it's a CCE issue or, right, if it's the particular Rockham version. So shoehorning it too much for us, right, where we don't have the ability to uh, customize right. it to test things out, of course, uh, isn't as helpful. But yes, I think that if that's what's easiest for you to reproduce, especially if you have things like, um, yeah, I don't know, specific software or something. Yeah, the, the reasons that you're mentioning, um, yeah. then that should be fine. If we can't work with it, we might ask for something different, but. I, I, don't, I don't mean that containers are supposed to be like the static thing where you can't change something. It, it's um, like on, on the most fundamental level, it's a tar file, right? With, with some environment settings. Um, and so, um, I, I was just um, curious to see, um, especially the, the machine learning uh, people, you know, they don't have a single app. They, 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 they're, if you ask them to tar up everything, they're going to send you a 10 gigabyte tar, right? Um, so, uh, but yeah, I, I think this is an opportunity to, uh, that um, at least it, it can then uh, get the consulting staff from the same, in the same environment, so at the same starting point, uh, and then, you know, be able to you know, see what the user sees more and more clearly. Yeah, and that's what we try to do, right? With mm -hmm. basically assuming that we are starting with a fresh login, tell me what to do mm -hmm. to set up your environment. Um, but yeah, in some cases, maybe it's not as simple. Uh, and you're not able to just say, okay, I have these modules loaded. Um, and I use this make file and run. And so in those cases, right, um, seems like you would be able to uh, you know, use that as a test as well. Like I said, as, as long as you can still customize it a little bit. Yeah. Okay, everyone. I think we're, we're a bit over time now. It's, it's 10 after uh, 12. And I don't want to stop people from getting on to their next sessions today. So once again, let me, let me just thank everybody one more time, all, all of our panel members, our speakers, and everyone from the audience who, who contributed and with comments or questions. Uh, thank you all very much. 
uh, thank you for coming to the session and goodbye for now. See you all uh, next time. Uh, enjoy the rest of the, the ECPAM. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone.